name is Moshe Zadka. My website is cobadism.com where you can find every way of getting in touch with me known to humankind. And today I want to talk to you about Python sidecars. I do want to start with an acknowledgement of country. I live in Belmont in the San Francisco Bay Area Peninsula, the ancestral homeland of the Maui Tusho Ohlone people. I want to start with a quick Kubernetes refresher to make sure that we're on the same page. Kubernetes is pretty big, so this is definitely not a comprehensive Kubernetes review. So uh, let's start with pods and containers. A pod is a basic execution unit in Kubernetes. That's what we execute. It's usually not what we configure, and that's going to be really important, both of these things later. A pod is made of n containers. A pod can have more than one container. They're all going to be in the same pod. They do share a network space, which means, for example, 127.0.0.1 is the same IP for all of them. They might share um, the process namespace. You can configure it on and off, and we'll talk a little bit about this later. Um, they can share volume mounts, so you can mount the same volume into both of them, and they will share that, um, that part of the file system, but they never share the overall file system. So this is like the little bit of things that are going to be important later as we're talking about how to operate your sidecars. Um, the other thing that's important in a pod is the readiness. Readiness is kind of a weird thing that is basically the criterion, is the pod good? Why do you need to know if the pod is good? We'll talk about this later. This will become very important later. Um, the usual way to determine if the pod is good is do TCP or HTTP check, which means you're sending in a TCP check. If it connects and does a TCP handshake, it's successful. Um, the more sophisticated check that Kubernetes can configure is the HTTP check, which will fail on any status that is not uh, 2xx. Um, you can also configure command checks. Basically, the whole morass of like issues around them. Usually, I would not recommend them, and we'll talk about some of the ways that um, writing sidecars can alleviate the need to write command checks in Kubernetes. The next thing that I want to uh, make sure that we're all on the same page in is deployments and services. There's many other things that you would need a sidecar for that are not deployments and services, but since these are the most common, um, let's focus on them for this talk. So a deployment is kind of a weird Kubernetes object because it's really just uh, something that will automatically configure a replica set and a service. So if you understand those two, you also understand what deployment is. A replica set is a collection of identityless pods. And what I mean by identityless, there's no sense in this instance. This pod is the fifth pod in the set. If it's six pods, it's six pods. But if two die, it will bring up two other pods, but it doesn't which one is like the true continuation of the next pod. There is no sense that this would make a sensible question. Um, a service is something that can route to good pods. There's many ways to route, and I will not go into them because for the most part, they're not going to affect our talk. But it's very important because if you remember earlier, I said that a readiness check is deciding what's a good pod. The reason you need to know if a pod is good or not is the service can know if to route, whether to route to it or not. And again, all of these things um, are a very important context because they will be important later. Um, sidecar is not an atomic thing in Kubernetes. There is no point where you will write in your Kubernetes YAML configuration, sidecar. Or, you know, you can if you call something a sidecar, but that's not a concept, that's not a type in Kubernetes, but it is a pattern. And specifically in Kubernetes, often when we say a pattern, what we mean is it's a shape that a YAML file takes, and when the YAML file takes that shape, we'll call the resulting thing a sidecar. So what does a sidecar pattern look like? It looks like a container, a pod that has an extra container. And usually it just means a second container because usually you have a main container that does the thing that you are doing with the pod, right? Um, if you think in terms of like a web application or a web API, 
this is a thing that actually runs the web server, right? If you think in terms of like a queue consumer, this is a thing that consumes the queue and, you know, does something with it, does processing and, and like, you know, takes it away. Um, the idea of the sidecar is that it takes care of the rest. And obviously this is a pattern. So all these definitions are somewhat fuzzy. And to be very honest, it's kind of not really a meaningful debate to say whether a specific thing is a sidecar or not. What's important is to know that this pattern is a pattern that will be really useful when you're designing a Kubernetes installation. So you say, oh, well, what could be a useful sidecar here? Right? There's no reason to get hung up on the definition of whether it's a true sidecar or not. Um, so here's like an example of a sidecar, right? The main container runs a web application and then the application wants to cache to files. Now, usually it's kind of awkward to also have the garbage collector sitting in the same process, right? Because, you know, web servers run in a specific framework that's going to manage all of these things starting to shove like an extra thread or like, you know, spawning a process and then having to manage what happens if the process dies. That's why we have Kubernetes for, right? Like the whole point of Kubernetes is manages that kind of stuff, right? If you wanted to manage that, you wouldn't, you know, be using Kubernetes in the first place. So what you can do is you can have a sidecar container and that looks at like files that are like, say, too old and, and, and remove them. Right, so it basically functions like the garbage collection thread or, or process, but now Kubernetes is managing it. It's managing a different container. And one of the things that's nice in that is a different container, it is built separately, right? You build those containers into separate like CI pipelines or whatever it is that you use to build containers. And so you don't have to use the same base image. You don't have to use the same platform. You don't have to use the same language. So why is sidecar useful? Um, so first of all, um, the, you can separate the resource limits, uh, meaning you can make sure that your web application can take only so much memory and your uh, sidecar does a garbage collection can take so much memory and you know how much memory you allocate to each. They can't kind of go and steal from the other uh, one's memory. And that's very useful when you want to do very um, careful capacity planning as at some point you will need to do. Um, they, they're also legible to Kubernetes dashboards, right? If you put both of these things in the same container and they die, they get restarted, you'll have to also like, you know, make sure that you keep track of that somehow to make it legible, right? If you put them in separate containers, Kubernetes knows if a container died, right? Kubernetes knows um, what, what like, like to separate the containers logs and so on. So that's very useful that you can, you know, Obviously, there's like the native Kubernetes dashboard and quite potentially like, you know, whatever cloud provider has like more stuff around Kubernetes. So like, that's why I don't say the Kubernetes dashboard. It's general Kubernetes dashboards, right? It might be Prometheus, you know, grabbing data from Kubernetes, whatever way you have it, like observability for Kubernetes, the sidecar will be legible to it. Um, but most importantly, it simplifies the container, right? Like if we want to go with the model of a container is supposed to be very simple. This is a way to offload the complexity to Kubernetes where you want it. And to have each of these containers, both the main container and the side container, each be much simpler than if they would somehow have to be carefully finagled to uh, be in the same container. So, um, Obviously, like the reason I talked so much about readiness earlier is that um, that's going to be one example for why you would need a sidecar. So, for example, with a readiness sidecar, you can check that the file exists or that the file is pretty new. Uh, you can check the contents of an HTTP response. This is not something that's very easy to do with the Kubernetes management, but you can easily send an HTTP code and now you write your own code so you can, you know, write it in a nicer language like Python. You can have an arbitrary logic and you don't have to like start, you know, shoving in shell commands into YAML and have them exec in the Kubernetes container and make sure that they, you know, properly offer and stuff. And, and like, there's a whole other thing. And like, this is like, you know, easier, right? You can just write code in Python. Python is a nice language. You can easily check the contents, like do all kinds of like, you know, complicated logic. It's easy. 
The other nice thing that you can do with Sidecar is collect metrics. Um, what if the original container wrote some code and that wasn't formatted in like the way that your metrics management, say Prometheus, uh, which most of them kind of are compatible with, can, can read. Well, you can grab those metrics via whatever. We format them into Prometheus. You can also do synthetic checks. You can like send a query to like an API endpoint, measure how much time that took, and that can be like a nice gauge or a histogram, depending on exactly how you do that. You can even scan a log file, check say how many black like, lines are there, and that can be your metric, right? Like, you know, how many lines were written in the last minute, right? So that's a useful um, metric that you can expose. And so there's a bunch of stuff that you can do that's like that, that you can just do in a sidecar. Um, you can also do schedule tasks, right? Like I already gave the example of garbage collection, or you can do some sort of a re-indexing operation. Again, like the sidecar shares um, <coughs> all the knowledge that the uh, main container has, so it can directly go with the API and kind of, you know, grab the data, do whatever re-indexing you need on it, and then shove it back through the API. Why write sidecars in Python? So there's a lot of things that make Python an ideal uh, choice for a sidecar. So if you think about it, um, if you really, a lot of your examples, if you really knew that you needed like that functionality early in the development process, you would already kind of put it in the design and, and make sure it fit, right? The problem is retrofitting it, it is hard. Uh, but that also means it's late in the development process. You don't have a lot of time left in your schedule. Luckily, Python is a great prototyping language. You can whip out something that kind of works very, very fast. So that rewards the ability of Python to quickly prototype. Now, the main thing that a sidecar will do is like to look good in some sense on the dashboard, right? That means that you want a very, very fast feedback loop um, again, that gives you um, a lot of reward for fast iteration speed, right? It's not just easy to write the first version of, of Python programs, it's also really fast to iterate on them. Python has a lot of facilities that makes iteration a lot faster. Um, and also, kind of the way politics in engineering works, often the sidecar will be built by slightly different people than the people who build the main car, right? Like they might be like, you know, kind of the deployment team or the infrastructure team or the SRE team, people who kind of adapt to that, maybe an embedded SRE, um, which means that like the container will keep moving and the sidecar needs to keep moving along with it. It's really nice if you have something where you can adapt as changes are in, in the container cause whatever logic you had is a sidecar to go out of date to be faster. So this means that like, if you can chase the container code faster than the container code moves, you're in, a dis you're in an advantage if you take longer for your cycles to, to modify when the container code moves, you're perpetually going to be uh, more and more behind. So um, I think this is kind of the fun part of the talk where I will give you an examples. Um, the challenge I gave to myself is to fit a sidecar on a slide. That does mean that the code is optimized for the slides, not best practices. This is not how I would actually write this code in practice. It's mostly to show what bits and pieces would make a sidecar work. And um, hopefully they're going to be fun because you can kind of get all the details in, a, in one slide. This also does mean the slides are going to be a bit packed. So get ready for a fun journey. So here's like a really... Uh, quick uh, readiness sidecar. Uh, as you can see, um, in order to raise an exception, I just divide one by zero uh, because that's literally the fastest code that will, uh, the shortest code that will raise an exception in Python, just three characters. Um, so this means that I can, you know, grab the data, compare it to, let's say, five. And then we start with the response. Okay, if it's not five, there is an error. Most um, web framework will automatically um, give you a 500 that complies with Kubernetes. I have just enough code to hook this um, this function into Pyramid. I have routing. That's it. That this is other than imports. This is fully functional code that will give you 
a readiness check, assuming that you have a JSON that uh, has a key called value that has to be five. So this is fully functional uh, readiness sidecar. Uh, here's a metric sidecar. It takes a little bit more code because I have to integrate with um, the Prometheus client library. So that means I have to build the collector registry and I have to build a gauge for latency. Um, and then um, I basically sent a synthetic request, check how long it took, set the la latency, and I generate the <laughs> um, the uh, Prometheus uh, thing. And again, if you, you know, set everything up in Kubernetes correctly, set Prometheus up with the right configuration, this will give you a gauge that shows the latency of the application, which means if the application is heavily loaded or it's like garbage collecting or something, it, this will take longer and you will be able to see it on a dashboard. And you don't even have to count on the application actually measuring itself at any point here. Um, Here's a simple example of a scheduler sidecar, right? So all it takes care of just, you know, periodic making sure that the application flashing its queue. You might think, well, why not just put a Kubernetes cron job? Well, a cron job is a job, which means it is a pod. But let's say that you want this, every single container of the main application has its own kind of internal queue that you want to flash once in a while to make sure that it flashes. This is fully functional code and it will actually do the job and you actually don't have a much easier way to do that. So um, three lines of Python, this was very easy to fit on a slide. Um, so those are like some fun uh, sidecars. Uh, now I'm gonna fail in my challenge because the next sidecar I have is gonna be slightly longer than the slide but we will break it down to a few slides. So it's gonna be my log analyzer sidecar. Um, so to challenge myself, I gave myself you know, kind of like some fun uh, parameters, right? Um, like I said, you can actually mount a volume and so like share files natively. Um, but let's say for any kind of reason, you don't want to do that, right? It, it just doesn't fit your model. So the main, you know, there can be all kind of permission issues and look weird corner cases where it wouldn't make sense. So the main container logs to var log something. That var log something is inside the container's uh, uh, file system. So it wouldn't be accessible naively to other containers. Um, and you want the sidecar that uh, processes the log. In this example, I think it's gonna count the lines, but obviously in real life, you'll do something slightly more interesting. Um, but this almost seems like an impossible challenge. So I think the fact that like, you know, I can't fit it in one slide is uh, maybe okay. I'll be able to fit it in like a handful of slides. Um, so the first trick is that to configure the pod correctly. So we need to share the process namespace process namespace, that doesn't sound very useful. Ah. So the first step is to find our root. Why do you have to know yourself? Because you can't know others unless you know yourself. This sounds like, like a weird, like mystical philosophy, but I promise you this is actually um, concrete technical advice. Um, because now we can look for another process which has a different root than ours. Ah, uh, now we managed to get to the other process root, right? Which means we already have access to the uh, peer containers uh, operating system. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so now we have uh, access to the file system that's in the other container. Um, now we can just, you know, read the log, um, sum the lines, uh, and then, you know, post it to like some, you know, kind of push metrics collector, let's say, and that's it. You know, we're done. So, you know, it was a bit more than a slide, but in three slides, we did something that most people would tell you is impossible. So uh, I think this is a pretty cool um, um, thing about showing both the strengths of like the kind of stuff you can do with sidecars and the kind of power that you have with Python that you can do the impossible in three slides, not even full slides, uh, worth of code. So I think that's uh, kind of cool. So I want to leave you with uh, a few final thoughts about containers. Um, the black boxes, right? You don't want to mush around with a container. Like once the container has been tested, you want to keep it as is throughout the deployment cycle. Um, and you want to keep your container simple. The simpler the container is, the you know easier it is to go, gonna be to manage. Um, but you will have to like always add something. Uh, pods, 
and the equivalent things on other frameworks to uh, that run containers. Um, what they do is they allow adding stuff from the outside. At least it's a clear-ish separation of responsibilities. So that's pretty useful. Um, you can build the container to be more sidecar friendly. That's actually more important than building a container to not need a sidecar. And one trick is to just have good APIs inside the container. You can, for example, listen on a separate port that's not exposed um, outside. So it's only going to be exposed to your peers, which means you can you know, do a lot less um, permission checking, but still define a really well-defined API, which means um, you don't care about security, but you do care about um, portability so that it's easier for the sidecar container to know which API to expect. Um, so packaging stuff is containers is pretty good. This is not a controversial statement in 2022. Everybody agrees. Um, packaging stuff in separate containers is even better. You don't want to shove a container that is like the everything container or you back to like, you know, why even have a container? So the more sidecars you have, the better your packaging architecture is. And with that, uh, thank you so much for listening to my talk. Um, I hope you had fun and I hope you're going to go and write a lot more sidecars. Goodbye.